Okay, good morning. Um, hopefully my voice will be a little bit better today. So today we're going to talk um, some more about um, time complexity. We'll see our first few complexity classes uh, of the course, of which there will be many. Um, talk about universal Turing machines. Make a bit of an intro to our first main theorem in the class, which is called the time hierarchy theorem. We'll prove it uh, next time. Uh, but before we get uh, fully into that, I want to recap something that we were talking about at the end of the last class, which I didn't fully get time to explain properly. So in the last class, uh, we were talking about simulations and how you could you know, take an algorithm written on one kind of model of computation, like let's say a multi-tape Turing machine, and convert it to an algorithm uh, on a different model of computation for example, the one-tape Turing machine, which we decided would be our official model. And furthermore, that you could do that without too much slowdown. Uh, so I wanted to show for uh, you how you can, um, let's say, take a, or sketch for you, how you can take a, an algorithm written for, let's say, a three-tape Turing machine. I just picked the number three at random. It's bigger than one. Uh, and simulate it with a one-tape Turing machine. And let me actually add here, because we're going to care about the efficiency, <laughs> Uh, running in, let's say, with time complexity t. With a one-tape Turing machine m1, time complexity well, the main thing to remember is it's um, quadratic. It's order t of n squared also plus order n. So remember, of course, the time complexity is not a number of the Turing machine, but it's a function. It's the function that maps the number n to the most number of steps the Turing machine will ever take on an input of length n. Yeah? Um, for multi-tape Turing machines, is order of time t is one step involved moving all three heads? Yeah, that counts as one step. Um, it doesn't make a big deal if you count that as three steps, because we're really not going to be concerned. I'll mention this more later about constant factors, like in the big O in our running time. But usually that counts as one step. Okay, so almost always we only consider you know, time complexities that are at least linear because we assume the Turing machine probably reads the whole input. So it's basically just order t squared time. Okay, so let me sketch again the simulation and we'll just look quickly at why it's about t squared, the, the slowdown. So the simulator is a one tape Turing machine and it's got to kind of simulate uh, M, M3's action. And so M3 has a state, which M1 can kind of keep track of with its own state. And M3 has you know, three tape heads, three tapes, and three tape heads. And there are a variety of ways that you know, M1 can keep track of this. So I just picked one explicit one, but other people had good suggestions for alternate methods in the last class. That's weird. Uh, so we'll just assume that M1 uh, has its tape, and it's always in this format. It's got like this punctuation mark. Uh, the hash symbol. In between are the contents of the three tapes in the simulation. And it also uses these mark cells, these dots, to remember where the three tape heads are supposed to be. Okay. And this is a key observation. Um, since, you know, the three tape machine, M3, runs in time, you know, T of N, uh, the lengths of its three tapes are always at most t of n sim symbols. So this is a very simple observation, but it's actually a very important one, which is that a Turing machine can never use more space, more memory, than the time it runs in, because it can only add one symbol at most you know, lengthen the, the, the contents of its tape by at most one symbol in one time step. So therefore, M1's tape has length, you know, at most uh, 3 times Tn plus 3, which I'll just say is order T of n, always. And that's going to be an important thing to remember, that M1's tape is always, uh, you know, at most order T uh, cells. 
because it's going to have to kind of go back and forth along this tape a lot when it's doing the simulation. <coughs> OK. So let me just quickly go through the simulation, sketch it. So um, there's some initialization at the beginning. So the one tape Turing machine, M1, actually just gets its input written on the tape. But it kind of has to convert it to this format, the, the format that the three tape would get it in. So that means, you know, taking, uh, you know, this and changing it so that it looks like this. The star here, I'm not drawing the Turing machine boxes, but hopefully you get it. Okay, because that's the sort of tape configuration and head configuration that the three tape Turing machine would start in. And this takes about order n time. Okay, and that accounts for this order n up here and the overall running time. Okay, now the main simulation. So to simulate one step of M3, so M1 will make a pass over the whole tape. Okay, uh, in order to find out the three symbols being read. <coughs> okay, so it makes a pass over this long tape, figures out where the dots are, and then it can say, say to itself, okay, M3 would have its third head reading E, its second head reading blank, its first head reading A. Um, and it also always sort of knows what state M3 is, is in. I should mention that this takes order T time, just to walk along the whole tape. And that's using the observation that the M1's tape is length at most order T. Okay, and let me just uh, say that, like, at this point, <coughs> let's say after this part of the simulation, you know, it'll end in a state with name, well, this is not very rigorous, but I'm trying to get the idea across. Like, you can imagine, like, its state at this time, time might be called something like Q, you know, finish reading. You know, heads, reading, what was it, A, blank, E, and I ran out of room to name the, head, the state here. You know, M3 in state, you know, Q7. Like, that's the whole name of, like, a, hypothetically, like, the state it might be in. So you could see, like, M1 state is recording, like, what state M3 was supposed to be in and the other three different, you know, symbols that uh, it was reading. And this part is indicating that, like, where it is in the algorithm. It just finished passing over the tape. So you can see it's going to have, like, a tremendous number of states. You know, like, just this part will require, like, one state for each state of M3 plus, you know, uh, the third power of the number of symbols in the tape alphabet. Did you get my drift, though, about, like, what's, how it's, it's, it's proceeding? Yeah? Um, could you also reduce the Instead of marking input by putting a dot on an input, uh, say, inserting a head symbol? Yeah, this was a suggestion. I don't know if you brought it up last time, or maybe somebody else brought it up last time. You can maybe make this simpler um, by doing different things. For example, you could kind of make a, put the configuration here, if you remember how we defined configuration. So you, instead of explicitly putting a dot, you could um, shift it over one and write the name of the state in here. You have to be a little careful, right, because you don't have these different states for each tape. M3 is always just in one state. So you would, you know, have the, it would be the case that you would always have the same state symbol in each of the three segments of the tape, which is fine. But, um, well, you still end up at the end of it kind of, you still, I think, need this kind of state because after you make your pass through it, like, you would, what you would have learned is, like, what state M3 is supposed to be in and what the three symbols are. So, yeah, it could make the actual design easier or harder. There's, yeah, several ways you could do it. Okay. 
So now it kind of knows what M3 would do. It would, you know, maybe move this tape head left, and this tape head right, and this head tape head left, and change this to a B, and change this to a C, and change this to an I, or something like that. So it just has to do that. So next step is another pass to implement, you know, one step of M3. So move all the dots one space and uh, change the symbols. And there is an issue here which was brought up last time, which is kind of annoying, but what are you going to do? Um, if, you know, a tape head moves on to a, onto a hash sign, you need a subroutine to shift M1's tape, you know, to open up a blank in the middle. All right, so if, you know, M3 would move this tape head to the right, then M1 is going to have to, like, copy this whole piece over by one and stick a blank in here. Hmm. Okay, so how much time does this take? Actually, I had in my notes that it takes order T of N time. It definitely takes order t of n time if you don't have to do this copying. Can you do that copying in uh, order t time? Hmm. It might be what? Could be order, I mean, this, this issue is just occurring to me now. Like if you have to copy like half the tape, the tape might have length t. Uh, Just one square. Yeah, oh yeah, you can do that in one, you know. Yeah, yeah. I just panicked there for a second, but I think it's okay, right? You, uh, if you just need to open up one tape cell, you can do that with basically one pass. You know, you just remember the character you're on, go to the right, write what you're remembering, remember this, write what you're remembering, and so forth. Okay, good. Yes, people agree to that, hopefully. Okay, so this can also, even, even if you have to do this issue, it's still only order t time. And, uh, yeah, that's it, okay? And then at the end of the simulation, you just do what you need to do. So overall, the whole time, to do one step of M3 costs you T time, and M3 does that most T step, so overall it's order T squared, plus this order N for initialization. Okay. Any questions about this? All right, great. Ah, um, I didn't write it in full details. So each, let me write this more carefully, each step of M3 costs order t time on M1. Okay, so just one step of M3 takes time t on M1. You've got to do it up to maybe t times. Yeah. Okay. Um, actually, I want to talk a little bit about multi-tape Turing machines. They're, um, in many ways, you know, nicer than one-tape Turing machines. Um, that's why they're often used as the default uh, model of computation. Um, for example, they often give more realistic, realistic run times for problems. So I'm going to do an example to show you why you would care about multi-tape Turing machines. Um, this palindrome's problem. Remember, this is the language of all strings that are the same as the reverse. So it's just checking if a string is the same as its reverse. Um, this is solvable in order n time on a two-tape machine. That's kind of reasonable. I mean, if you think about, you know, writing just like uh, some pseudocode for solving palindromes, it should take about order n time. You just start pointers at the beginning and the end of the, the word and move them inward and check that the characters match as you go along. 
Uh, so let me show you that. So let's say we want to design a two-tape machine to check if a string is the same as its reverse. Man, I'm sick of drawing these tapes already. OK, so let's say, hypothetically, the input is some string. OK, like remember. Uh, so we're designing a two-tape machine. So it's got two tape heads. The input goes on the first tape. The second tape starts out as blank. Um, good. So what will the algorithm do? Can somebody describe it for me? Yeah. Like you basically copy down the, the string to the second during the machine tape, and then you just like start pointers at either ends and make sure that the letters are the same. Yeah. I did it the reverse way in my head, but that's equally good. So what you can do is, um, I think the suggestion was, have the second tape head just write what's being read by the first tape head. So that would copy the R down here. And then have both the tape heads move to the right. And so you can copy the first tape onto the second tape in like N steps. OK, and so at that point, you know, the tape heads will be maybe both here, and you'll have used up order and time. And uh, then, I didn't quite catch what you said, but I assume what you said is uh, you can send this tape head back to the beginning, but just keep this tape head staying put all the time. Yeah? Is it possible, like, in a two tape to have one tape stay put and one tape um, move? Because the you mean head? This needs to move. How does that, how does that work? Yeah, there's uh, some very interesting Piazza post about this that you can uh, check out that Sonny and William were talking about. But uh, in particular, if there's a subtlety that I threw in there last time. I explicitly allowed multi-tape Turing machines to use the stay put. Um, it's not a big deal, but like otherwise it's annoying because if it always has to move left or right, then like the two tape heads will always both be in like an even position or both be in an odd position. It's like a little bit annoying, so let's just say that in, in multi-tape Turing machines, you're allowed to have a head stay put. It's a very perceptive question, yeah. So, um, so this tape head will just stay put always, and you'll just walk this tape head back until it hits a blank, and though it knows it got to the beginning. So now the picture will be like this. That also takes order and time. Okay, and now like uh, the Turing machine will just compare the symbols that it's reading under its two heads. And if they're different, it can reject. And if they're the same, then it'll move this one left and this one right. So it'll be like, same, same. Oh, now B and M are different, so it could reject in this case. But if it really were a palindrome, you know, they would go all the way, uh, checking things would check out until they both hit blanks, and then the Turing machine could accept. OK, so this routine of comparing one string to its reverse will also take order and time. So the whole algorithm is order and time. Okay, and it's kind of nice. I mean, it's sort of roughly equivalent to like what you would do with like a normal programming language. Any questions about that? Um, good. <clears throat> now, on the other hand, uh, that's nice. You might say, well, that's fine. Maybe a one-tape Turing machine could also do it in order and time. Uh, if you recall in lecture two, I think I actually showed you on that like Morphet uh, simulator. Um, a palindrome checker on a one-tape Turing machine. Uh, and it took um, order n squared time. <coughs> if you remember how to do this like zigzagging thing where it would like start at the beginning, remember that it was an R, Walk to the end, check that that's an R. Walk to the beginning, check this E matches this E, and have to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, which is like quadratic time. Um, and here's a cool uh, fact. This was proved like in the prehistory, uh, days of complexity theory by Henny in 1965. Um, any one tape Turing machine solving palindromes 
needs quadratic time. So basically, there's no way to do it other than this like back and forth, back and forth thing that takes n squared time. And um, you know, I told you in the first lecture that it's like very hard for you know people to prove negative results for algorithms. And this actually is a negative result for algorithms. It says you cannot do it in essentially faster than n squared time. But this theorem is actually not too hard. I mean, I could prove this to you in like 35 minutes or something. So I'm not going to do that. Um, that's probably we have better use of our time, but just to tell you that like, you know you can go and like look online and see a proof of this theorem. It's not very hard. Yeah. Can you also try to prove the stretching problem needs both omega of n squared or oh, no, open that we did last time? No, I saw a paper that proves something like it needs n squared time in a certain model. So I'll put that on Piazza. Yeah. Um, good. So actually, this is kind of good to know. Because this shows, I mean, it's interesting. It shows like an inherent that this quadratic time gap between one tape Turing machines and let's say even two tape Turing machines is inherent. You know that we couldn't have made this simulation if we, no matter how smart we were, we couldn't have made this simulation be better than tn squared time, because you know there are just some problems that, um, you know, they can be solved in linear time on a two tape Turing machine, but they need quadratic time on a one tape Turing machine. Um, so, uh, yeah, one lesson to take away from this is that at least when you're studying complexity or in this class, we're not going to get like too excited about the difference between linear time and quadratic time and uh, factors like this. So, I mean, it is important in general in life, but it depends on like what model you choose. And so it, it's going to be better if you make definitions that are not like so sensitive to uh, the difference between linear time and quadratic time, for example. And that'll come up today when we define this complexity class P, uh, things solvable in polynomial time. OK, questions about this? OK, so speaking of which, uh, we're going to define our first complexity class now. <coughs> and it's a complexity class based on uh, just running time. And it's called time. Uh, okay, so here it is. Um, let t be a function from length, sort of, you know, maybe running times. For example, you know, t of n equals n squared is classic. Um, okay, so this complexity class, time t of n is defined to be all the languages L, or decision problems L, uh, such that there exists a Turing machine. And for us, this is a one-tape Turing machine. Deciding L in order t of n time. OK. So this is going to be an important definition for us, so I want to make some comments on it. Yep? Um, why is it for the Boston rational not the other Oh, just because like, sometimes we might want to consider like, uh, t to be like n log n. You know, and then like log, n log n, is, you know, its, its output value is not uh, a natural number. It's not a big deal. It's just like we'd rather write that than, let's say, writing like, ceiling of n log n every time we wanted to say n log n. OK. So this is the first example of what's going to be a complexity class. And there are a few things to note about it. Oh, let me just, before I get into that, just give you an example. You know, we know because of this fact, which we didn't really prove, but we saw it, that the language palindromes is in the class time n squared. You know, because there is a one tape Turing machine running in time order n squared, which decides palindromes. OK, so let me make some uh, 
remarks. So first, this complexity class time t, or time n squared as an example, uh, is a set of languages. So it's really, I mean, as a mathematical object, it doesn't actually mention computation exactly. It's just a collection of decision problems, a collection of languages. So you see, for example, this is a language, all the strings that are palindromes, and it belongs to this complexity class. Um, okay. Another important remark is that this big O is built into the definition. And at the beginning, you might not you know, know how to feel if that's a good idea or not, a bad idea. I mean, it's convenient because you know, we can just write time n squared here, and that includes a you know, big O of n squared. Um, but I want to tell you actually that it, um, it's kind of sensible that it's built into the definition, that somehow the definition is not uh, sensitive to constant factors in the running time. And uh, let me try to illustrate this by telling you a fact. Sometimes, this is actually, this fact is based on a theorem called the speed up theorem, which sometimes people prove in complexity classes. I'm not going to prove it, but I'll just tell it to you, and it's a little bit surprising actually the first time you see it. Um, here's a fact. It's meant to illustrate that like, it's not very sensible, it's not like worth it or sensible to like worry about constant factors when you're talking about Turing machines. So, here's a fact. Suppose there exists a Turing machine deciding a language L. In, um, let's say, uh, five times n cubed steps. Okay, so you. You cooked up a Turing machine that solved your problem in five n cubed steps. Then, there also exists a Turing machine deciding the same language L in um, about n cubed time. And there's also another Turing machine deciding L in about 1 over 100 n cubed time. Or 1 over 1,000 n cubed time. Now, this looks like a very crazy statement, but uh, it's true. It's saying that like, you can always, whenever you have a Turing machine solving a problem, there's a trick you can do that'll just speed up its running time by a factor of like 10, or 100, or 1,000, or any constant that you want. That's very disconcerting, right? It actually, it's... Um, it's a reflection of just the, the way we define Turing machines, and maybe it's saying like the definition of Turing machine is not perfect, um, but it's a fact. Can anybody like guess maybe why why this would be true? Yeah. Just increasing the number of states or symbols. Yeah, you can do it by like a trick that like uh, increases the number of symbols. So like if you want to speed up your Turing machine by a factor of like ten or something. Let's say your Turing machine just had tape alphabet 0, 1, and blank. Well, then you like make a new Turing machine with like a, a, a very large tape alphabet with like, you know, 20 symbols. And then like, you know, with 20 symbols, you can have one of those stand for, I guess like four, I don't know, maybe make it 100 symbols, like four ta tape symbols in the original machine. So you can like compress like all the tape cells in the original Turing machine into like one tape cell, like a bunch of them into one tape cell. And then your Turing machine can kind of like do, you know, like four steps, your new Turing machine can like do like four steps at a time. Um, so I don't want to get into the details because it's like kind of revealing that like there's something a little bit weird going on. Um, but yeah, by basically by the trick of like increasing the number of states and increasing the tape alphabet a lot and like encoding like a bunch of cells in the original computation by like one cell uh, in the new machine, you can like artificially get like a constant factor speed up. 
And actually, the fact that you can do this comes from the fact that, like, in the Turing machine model, we don't, like, charge you anything for having more states or especially for having more tape symbols. And probably, like, if you really thought about it, you should probably, like, somehow charge a Turing machine, like, for having more tape symbols or more states. But, like, we don't do that out of simplicity. But then, like, you have this, like, weird phenomenon where you can kind of, like, cheat and, like, speed up the computation by a constant factor. I feel a little bit bad for even like talking about this because it's like a weird technicality that like I don't want you guys to like worry about very much. But anyway, um, I, bring, I bring it all up just to say that like it's not very because of this issue. It's like not very sensible to like get overly concerned about constant factors on running time for Turing machines because there are these like weird moves you can do to like speed things up by constant factors. All of which is to like justify a little bit like why. The definition has like a big O built into it. So it was sort of already officially saying like, you know, don't worry about constant factors. That's not the, the main thing that's going on here. Okay. That probably deserves a question or two from the audience. No? You're fine with it? Great. Yeah. Are there other models of computation that don't have this Um I think actually there's not really. I mean um, yeah, I mean, you always get into this issue of like, what is like one discrete object? Like, what counts as like one object in your model? Like, for example, if you let, it's not ultimately a great idea, let's say, to let one register or like one object contain a natural number. You can do it, but then it's a bit unfair because like, if that natural number gets super huge, you're somehow not charging yourself for it. So in the end of the day, you need to like have like a finite number of symbols, but then you know you have to decide you know do you further charge yourself for like having lots of symbols or a small number of symbols. So actually, honestly, I don't know a model where like these kind of issues don't come up. Yep. So like, why can't you just eventually keep reducing it? Why like why is it a constant factor reduction? Why doesn't it like just eventually reduce it to its lower class? Um, I guess basically because. Um, if you want to do this trick of, let's say, getting a speed up of a factor of 10, maybe that requires like uh, increasing the alphabet by a factor of, I don't even know what it would be, let's say 10 or 100 or something. I guess basically the Turing machine has to commit in advance to so like how many tape alphabet symbols it's going to have and how many states it's going to have. Um, so let's say, let's say you're trying to decide palindromes. You know, if you use a machine with a thousand symbols, maybe you can solve it in n squared over 10 time. And if you use a machine with 10,000 symbols, maybe you can solve it in n squared over 100 time or something like this. Um, but there's no way, there's no, you can't, there's no way you can solve it in like order n time, like, because you cannot, you can't say like, oh, I'm going to use ta a number of tape symbols equal to n. That would help, but like, you don't know what n is before you start, you know? So you have to, like, Turing machine has to, like, fix its finite size, and then an input comes in, which can be arbitrarily large, so. Yeah? So if a universal Turing machine can read the input and know how much it's n, and then construct a new Turing machine, I can do it in 1 over n, the n is squared by n. Yeah, but that machine itself will still have a finite size alphabet, so for it to, like, simulate an alphabet It'll have to simulate an alphabet of size n with its own like size 10 alphabet, and that will cause the slowdown. Yeah, these are good points though, and like that kind of issue will come up uh, later. Yeah. So the other machines have bigger alphabets. Uh, we're not. Yeah, like this machine will have a bigger alphabet than this one. This one will have an even bigger alphabet. This one will have an even bigger alphabet, and probably also more states. Right. So if we account for like the cost of simulation, it'll probably just go back. Right. That's possible too. Okay, so these are all the fine details that's like somehow better. N yeah. I feel like, you know, like later we'll get to the actual ideas and like these are kind of weird details, but. Um, okay, last remark I want to make is that it definitely depends. On like the Turing machine model. So for us, like, you know, we decided our official model was one tape Turing machines. Uh, and therefore, we know that, like, by this Hemi theorem, 
we know that palindromes is not in time n. But other people who take multi-tape Turing machines as their official model, they would be able to say that palindromes is in time n. And so this is all to get at the idea that like not only is it not so valuable to look at constant factors, it's not even that like great to worry about polynomial differences in running time. Because it depends, oh, are you using one tape Turing machine or a two-tape Turing machine or a multi-dimensional tape Turing machine or whatever. Um, right. I should mention, by the way, that also like this, people are like not that excited about this theorem, even though it's you know proving a negative result for algorithms, because it's somehow just reflecting some kind of stupid aspect of one tape Turing machines, the model, like if it needs to go from reading this symbol to reading this symbol, it takes like order n time, which Maybe in physical reality, you actually need to move some like photon or something from here to here, so it maybe takes linear time, but basically on normal computers with random access to the inputs or to memory, that shouldn't cost you very much. So somehow this is not so exciting in complexity theory because it's just ref reflecting like a weird factor of the model rather than something fundamental about computation. Okay. So actually based on all that uh, commentary about uh, well, you shouldn't get so um, picky about constant factors or even constants in the exponent. Um, people decided to invent this complexity class, which is you know, really the most important complexity class. It's the star of the show. So the complexity class is P. Okay, P, which stands for polynomial time, uh, is just, um, well, a funny mathematical way to write it is the union over all exponents k of time n to the k. So it's any language that can be, that is in time n to the k for any k. Okay, but, you know, in words, it's just like all languages decidable in polynomial time by a Turing machine. <laughs> in uh, complexity theory, maybe not in like hardcore algorithms theory, but in complexity theory, P is generally considered to be, uh, you know, informally the class of all problems that can be solved efficiently by algorithms. So of course there are objections like, well, a running time of n to the 1,000 is not really efficient, but there are also lots of counters to those objections like, in practice, you very rarely have algorithms that require n to the 1,000 time. Um, the main reason we like this definition very much is a very robust definition. Now what do I mean by that? What I mean is like it's very, it's mathematically elegant because it's very insensitive to things like the model. Okay, so, you know, in the previous lecture, you know, I put down all these models, you know, the pseudocode model or the RAM model and the multi-tape Turing machine and the one-tape Turing machine and the one-tape Turing machine with only one-way infinite tape, all these different models. And these simulation results show that, you know, any algorithm in this model can be converted to an algorithm in that model with slowdown that was at most I think fourth power was the worst thing, going from like RAMs to like one tape Turing machines. And that's very reassuring because it says that this complexity class P, things that can be solved in some polynomial running time, doesn't depend at all on what model you choose. It's the same if you, you know, show something that's in polynomial time on a RAM or with pseudocode, it's also the, in polynomial time on a one tape Turing machine, on a multi tape Turing machine or whatever. And conversely, if you show that like some problem cannot be solved in polynomial time on even a lowly one-tape Turing machine, you also know it cannot be solved in polynomial time even on like a, you know, a sophisticated C-like pseudocode. Okay? So it's really, you know, convenient and like, um, it's pleasant that it really doesn't depend on the model anymore. Um, it's also great that it has properties like if I have a polynomial time algorithm, uh, that uses like a subroutine for solving a different problem, and I don't know the complexity of solving that problem. But then I get like a polynomial time algorithm for the subroutine 
then the overall algorithm will be polynomial because you'll the main algorithm will run in polynomial time. It'll make at most polynomially many calls to the subroutine, and those calls take at most polynomial time. So like everything is polynomial time. So it's really it's really pleasant that like it's got this composition property. If you put algorithms together, all of which are polynomial time, the result will be polynomial time. Um, and in fact, you know, uh, in a couple lectures ago, I mentioned the same this thing called um, the extended Church Turing thesis, um, which if you accept it, it's not a theorem or anything, but if you accept it, it said that like all reasonable or physically plausible models of computation can be simulated by a Turing machine without most polynomial slowdown. So it sort of says that you know, any kind of reasonable model of computation you could think of, you'd still get the same complexity class P. Okay. Um, so that's why we're really happy about this complexity class P, and we generally informally equate it with problems that can be solved efficiently. Yeah? Uh, I, don't know, I don't know if you'll do this later, but there are some things called non-deterministic Turing machines. And yeah. Do we will. Also follow this? Uh, no. So there is something called a non-deterministic Turing machine, which we will talk about later in the class when we're talking about NP. And um, as far as we know, they cannot be uh, simulated with polynomial slowdown by normal Turing machines. Uh, in fact, that's exactly, that question is exactly the P versus NP problem, uh, which we believe has a negative answer. Um, but we're okay with that because, as you'll see, when we eventually define these non-deterministic Turing machines, it's not like a reasonable model of computation. It involves some like, mystical, magical guessing power of the machine, which is not considered a, a re realistic. Yeah? So this polynomial slowdown um, in the extended church Turing pieces, yeah. that's not proven, right? It just, it's a conjecture. Yeah, just because, you know, it's just... I don't even know if you would call it a conjecture. It's a hypothesis. I don't know. It's just um, people basically believe, okay, you can invent like a new programming language, you know, like Python or something, but like anything you can solve in polynomial time with Python or with like your new hypothetical programming language will also be solvable in polynomial time uh, on a Turing machine. And after a while, people are just believe it to be true. Okay. So, you know, it's again, as I said, um, you know, in, in, in the real world and, you know, in a class like 451 and algorithms, you will care about, let's say, the difference between linear time and quadratic time and n to the 10th time. It's very important. Uh, but there you have to specify exactly what model you're using. And, you know, in this class, we prefer to, like, not worry so much about the models, although we have talked about Turing machines a lot. And just say, like, any polynomial time will count as efficient for us. Okay, so um, in a couple of lectures, I'm going to talk about, you know, the, the gloriousness of algorithms in polynomial time, and uh, in that lecture, I'll do maybe next week or maybe the week after that, you know, I'm going to actually show you a bunch of decision problems, a bunch of languages that are surprisingly in P. You know, so many problems that you would actually want to solve are sometimes even surprisingly in P. You know, um, like telling if uh, there's a path from vertex S to vertex T in a graph. You can do that in polynomial time. It's kind of basically the same as solving a maze. And, you know, if you're like a kid, like solving a maze is hard. Um, so you might be a little bit surprised that you can do it efficiently. Or if you remember this kind of thing, there's problems like 3SAT uh, or 2SAT. Well, 2SAT is you're given a CNF formula. We'll do this in more detail later. You want to determine if it's satisfiable or not. And actually, it's quite surprising. You can do that problem efficiently. So there's a lot of problems that are surprisingly in P. And uh, if you're really um, optimistic, you might ask, maybe just every problem is solvable in polynomial time. Um, uh, well, that turns out not to be true. Uh, so let me ask you this. Are there any problems? There's certainly lots of problems where we don't know how to solve them in polynomial time. But there's fewer problems where we like, provably know they cannot be solved in polynomial time. So let me ask you, are there any problems provably not in P.
Does anybody know one? Yeah? It's just what I was hoping you would say. That's right. <laughs> the whole thing problem. So if you remember from 251, the whole thing problem basically is I give you a Turing machine. The input is a Turing machine and a string. And your task is to determine, would this Turing machine, when run on this input string, halt? And not only is that problem not solvable in polynomial time, it's not solvable at all. So there's no decider, you know, TM, solving this problem. Great, so there's definitely not one solving it in polynomial time. Um, now, a more interesting answer to this question, not that it wasn't interesting, in fact, that's exactly what I hoped somebody would say, and we're going to review that soon. But a more interesting answer to this question would be if you had a problem that was solvable in some amount of time, but was still not solvable in polynomial time. And uh, we're going to see in this class examples like that. So we'll eventually see in this class, you know, uh, language L, actually even like a natural one, like it's, you know, it's a sensible algorithmic problem, decision problem, but solvable in, let's say, you can do it better than this, but exponential time, some constant to the n time, but it's not in P. Okay, so I mean, this is not like a shocker. We, you know, kind of expect something like this would be true. That, uh, you know, if I only give you polynomial time, there's some problems you can't solve, even though you could solve them if you had exponential time. In fact, there are lots of languages where uh, it's easy to see that they're solvable in exponential time, and we really don't think they're solvable in polynomial time, but that part can be hard to prove. For example, uh, checking if a graph is three colorable, or any kind of well-known NP-complete problem. You can solve that in like exponential time by trying all the possibilities. We really don't know how to do it in polynomial time, uh, but we don't know how to prove that. But you know, not too long from now, we will actually find some problems like this where we can even prove they're not solvable in polynomial time. Yeah? In general, you can uh, use halt to construct a language with arbitrary time complexity, but just asking, like, does this halt in time 2 to the n? And you can't check that in time less than exponential. Yeah, that uh, is what will be the subject of like part of today's lecture and the next lecture. So what we'll see soon uh, is, um, well, I'm going to review this proof, actually. And then based on, you know, uh, similar to what Calvin said, we'll see how to like modify this proof. It's a little bit tricky to do it, but we'll modify this proof to get uh, a problem that um, can be solved in some amount of time, but cannot be solved with much less time. And that's called the time hierarchy theorem, and that'll be the subject of next lecture. Um, one downside of that is it gives kind of an artificial problem, uh, which is okay, but we'll see even later in the class natural problems with this property. Okay, so... Um, pray. So, you know, this, this fact, you know, tells you that with more time, you can solve more languages, which is actually plausible. Okay, so, um, yeah, the proof of this kind of statement is actually based on elaboration of this proof, uh, Turing's theorem, that the halting problem cannot be solved by any algorithm. So, although I've, you've seen it before, I'm going to do that theorem again, um, because... Well, we're going to do an elaboration on the argument. So let's actually recall precisely this theorem, Turing's theorem. And uh, let me just do it, instead of for the problem of the halting problem, I'll do it for like very slight variation, this language, maybe you remember from 251, except, or in Sipser's book, he calls it A sub TM. It's just you're giving a Turing machine, well, I'll write it. You're giving a Turing machine and a string, and you want to tell if the Turing machine accepts on that string. Okay, so...
OK, so this is the language that we're going to show is, or Turing is going to show, is not solvable by any Turing machine. Uh, and actually, I want to like, take a few seconds here to look at this in slightly more detail. Um, so at a high level, the input is supposed to be a pair, a Turing machine and a string. And at a high level, you know, the algorithm is supposed to decide, if I were to run this Turing machine on this string, would it accept? Or conversely, would it either reject or run forever? <coughs> and I just want to remind you here that like, these angle brackets um, are signifying an encoding of this pair. So in particular, we're assuming that you have some encoding of Turing machines, which you know, you have to, that actually takes a little bit of thought. You know, how would you encode a Turing machine by a string? Because you know, it has a lot of components, the, the states, and everything. Um, uh, but you can do it. And you also need like, to encode this pair, the Turing machine and the string. In fact, later in the lecture, I'll briefly um, put up on the screen uh, an illustration of a Turing machine that takes as input a Turing machine and a string. So you'll see an example of this. Uh, let me just make like, one more minor point. There's a bit of an annoyance, because a Turing machine can have like, an arbitrary tape alphabet, and uh, also an arbitrary number of states. And usually what, you know, when you describe your TAFE alphabet, you just make up some random symbols like, oh, it's got a zero and a blank, and it's got this hash mark, and you could put like, some other squiggly character and say, that's a TAFE alphabet symbol too. But um, it's not clear how you can encode like arbitrary squiggly syllable, symbol uh, as a string. So this is a very minor point, but like, when we're encoding a Turing machine, let's say we'll always assume that the Turing machine's Tape symbols and alphabet symbols are just the numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to however many you want, OK? So like the encoding will say, like, this Turing machine has 12 tape symbols, and then their names are just 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 11. OK, and if it, you know, the encoding will say this Turing machine has 18 states, and their names are just 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 17. OK, so in that way, you can encode like any arbitrary Turing machine you know, by strings. Um, right. OK. Any questions about that? Okay. So yeah, in the future, I'm going like, to really stop you know, worrying so much about this encoding stuff. But you know, since it's still towards the beginning of the class, I want to make a few notes like that. OK. So in order to prove Turing's theorem that there's no uh, Turing machine that uh, solves this problem, uh, we need this fact or theorem, which Turing proved. And it's quite an important uh, thing. But there exists a universal Turing machine. You might call it U. Uh, that takes as input you know, a pair M and W and simulates M on M on uh, W. OK? So you know, just like you could write some Python code that took as input a string representing some other Python code and an input, and it would simulate this Python code on that string, you can make a Turing machine that takes as input the description of another Turing machine and the input string and simulates this Turing machine on this string. In fact, uh, let me show it to you now. Um, up here on the tape is like its uh, you know, example input for this universal Turing machine. And let's take a look at it. Uh, it is really of the form, the description of a Turing machine followed by a string. So I think this one is a Turing machine whose job is to increment the number written on the tape in binary. So you see after, OK, the description of the Turing machine is the thing inside the square brackets. I'll come to that in a second. And then the input, like the W here, is 1011, which is whatever, um, 11. And this Turing machine's job is to increment the number written on the tape in binary. So it should eventually convert it to 1100. And the thing inside the brackets is really an encoding of the Turing machine with like 16 symbols. You can read about well, how the encoding actually works in that PDF. Uh, I'll say a few things about it. Um, <coughs> roughly speaking, uh, this Turing machine has three states. And the state 
descriptions are delimited by either colon or exclamation mark. Um, and mostly it's delimited by colons, but like it uses exclamation mark to signify like what is the current state. Okay, so it starts with, and that also lets uh, the encoding specify the initial state. So the exclamation mark specifies the initial state as well. So that first thing, which is like L plus comma zero R dot comma one R dot is like the initial encoding of the initial state of this Turing machine. And um, okay, this universal Turing machine actually cheats a little bit. It's not fully universal because it assumes it only lets you encode Turing machines with tape alphabet zero one blank. If this was like a full on universal Turing machine, it would uh, let you encode Turing machines that had arbitrary tape alphabet. Okay, but let's, I guess the person was like, I'm not going to go crazy. I'm just going to assume that the tape alphabet is 0, 1, blank. You could do the more general thing, but it doesn't. So since every Turing uh, tape symbol is 0, 1, or blank, each state, you know, it needs to explain what should be done if you're reading a 0, what you should be doing if you're reading a 1, what you should do if you're reading a blank. And so each state here has three parts, and those are delimited by commas. So you can see within, like, each block delimited by colon, like there's subparts delimited by commas. And those things look like a symbol and a letter, L or R. And then you'll see it's got like pluses and dots. And basically, this is a funny choice that this person made. Like, if you want to go from the first state to the fourth state, then you don't write down like four, saying I want to go to state four. You write down like three pluses, which means go to the state whose encoding is like three colons that way. Or if you want to go to the state which is like five colons to the left, you write like five minuses or something. Okay, so the details are not like super important, but, uh, and also I, I'm gonna start running, but I don't think it'll finish because it's very slow, but that's life. But you can see, okay, how does it work? Like, okay, it, it sort of, uh, you know, the head like spends most of its time inside the square brackets which is like reading the state. So it's got to like go, you know, look at the tape. Oh, I should also mention that at all times, it's pretty cool, like the way it encodes the position is, it writes the tape, but then it also it inserts, it inserts the description of the Turing machine in the middle of the tape at the location of the head. So like, it always, the symbol that's currently being read is always the one that's just to the right of the right square bracket, like outside the Turing machine's description. So it like goes, picks that up, then it goes inside the Turing machine description and like, you know, goes back and forth a few times to figure out what it needs to do. And it can figure out what new symbol to write. And then if like the head is going to move, let's say left, then it has to like move that whole bracketed thing like one step to the left and like copy this tape symbol over here so that it's always maintaining the right thing. So you see as it's going along, like the head is always in the position where that like long thing in the brackets, which represents the Turing machine is. And so it's, yeah, it's a little bit slow. Uh, but actually one thing that is kind of interesting, uh, if you think about it, is that if you think about the size of the Turing machine as being a constant, and you think of the size of the input as being very long, then actually this simulation runs in time that's like, it only uses a constant number of steps per step of the simulated Turing machine. Mm. Now each, that constant number of steps per step of the simulated Turing machine, oh, it finished. Um, that constant is very large and depends on the size of the description of the Turing machine. But basically doing like one simulation step, it's actually not that expensive. You know, if they do like a bunch of passes around the Turing machine's description, um, but, and you have to shift the position of the Turing machine, but like that's all a big constant, so it's actually sort of efficient in a weird way. Okay, well I wanted to show that to you. Any any questions about it? Yeah. Yeah, it's the, this particular Turing machine. It takes the the string written on its tape, views it as a binary number, increments it by one. This is what I said before. It like started out as one zero one one, which is eleven. It actually halted with 1100, zero, zero, which is 12. And like that three state Turing machine for like incrementing a number is actually also the Turing machine that like I was going to show you in lecture one or something, but I put it on Piazza for incrementing a binary number. Okay, so in fact, you know, a sample input, it's got like a Turing machine, the encoding of a Turing machine is like a palindrome detector. 
and that one's, that one's definitely slow. Um, and you can see the encoding of the Turing machine is quite long. And uh, yeah, OK. Um, so I wanted to explicitly show you that because, well, maybe you would have found it believable anyway, but um, you know, I want to try to more convince you that this uh, universal Turing machine exists. We didn't like prove it, but sort of there's the proof. As I said, it's not like fully, um, that thing I showed you is not fully complete because it only simulates Turing machines, or only allows Turing machines uh, with tape alphabet 0, 1, and blank, and theoretically it should allow arbitrary ones, but good enough. Um, and for Turing's theorem, that like, there's no Turing machine that uh, accepts the accepts language, um, we just need the existence of the universal Turing machine, as we'll see. But for our elaboration on this argument, uh, the time hierarchy theorem that proves you know, uh, stronger statements like this, we actually are going to need to care about the efficiency of U. And we're going to rely on the fact that actually not only does U exist, there are universal Turing machines U that are pretty efficient. In fact, as I was saying, this particular one is pretty efficient. Okay. Okay, so let me remind you now of Turing's theorem. There does not exist the Turing machine H that decides X sets. Okay, so the proof of this. Um, the idea behind the proof is sometimes called the diagonalization method because in some ways it's like similar to the Cantor's diagonal argument for showing that the set of, let's say, real numbers is uncountable. Um, not sure I love like thinking about it that way. Um, maybe I'll try to draw a picture with a diagonal on it, but let me just review the proof as I like to think about it first. Uh, okay, so it's definitely it's a proof by contradiction. So uh, suppose for a contradiction that such an H exists. Okay, that's a very powerful assumption. We have the assumption now that there is an algorithm H that you give it a Turing machine and a string W, it'll tell you whether or not the Turing machine accepts on W. That's like so powerful that we're going to construct an impossible object. So we'll now describe using H as a subroutine. Uh, maybe so-called diagonalizing, if you like this uh, idea, if you don't, Turing machine D, just say we'll construct some Turing machine D. Okay, so um, this Turing machine D treats its input as the encoding of a Turing machine, M. OK, so it's a little bit confusing. There's kind of a lot going on. Um, we're assuming this Turing machine H exists, which H takes as input a Turing machine and a string, and it does something. Well, it solves this problem. But just forget that for like one second. I'm going to define another Turing machine, D. And D takes as input the encoding of just one Turing machine. And let me comment here, by the way, um, recall our convention that, uh, our convention concerning encodings, that we assume that every string is an encoding of some Turing machine. So you see actually, let's say with that Morphet thing that I showed you, it's actually a pretty rare string that looks like the encoding of a Turing machine. Like, you know, for it to be a valid Turing machine encoding, it has to start with a left square bracket, and then it has to have these colons in the middle with like three commas in each segment and so forth. It uh, uses some alphabet of size 16. And, um, you know, there are some properly encoded Turing machines, but like most strings with this size 16 alphabet would just be like junk. 
But we take this convention that um, if you have like some jump string, then you just artificially say it corresponds to some simple Turing machine. Let's say the Turing machine that just immediately rejects. Any fixed Turing machine. So in this way that like any possible string counts as the valid encoding of a Turing machine. It is kind of a technicality, but like it's convenient to just, you know, because D could get his input any string to like have that count as some Turing machine. So in particular, like this universal Turing machine U, in some sense, the first thing it should kind of do is if it detects that it's got like a junky string, then it can just reject because it's like, oh, this is a junky string. That means by convention, it it's, uh, represents the Turing machine that always rejects. So I can just reject. So this is like a minor technicality. Um, good. So I want to keep describing to you what this Turing machine D does. Okay, so I'm, going to just, I'm describing D. It gets his input the encoding of a string M. So then D was, you know, works to prepare the string. This is a little funny. Uh, the encoding of M and the encoding of M. So it, it kind of, yeah, it makes the pair M and the encoding of M. And it runs. H as a subroutine. On this, remember H is a Turing machine that takes in the encoding of a Turing machine and some string. And for the Turing machine, we're going to use D's input M, and for the string, we're going to use the encoding of M. Okay, so now remember, H, you know, H is this amazing Turing machine, uh, decider Turing machine that has the magical ability to tell you if a given Turing machine would accept on a given string. So in particular, it, no matter what you give it, it halts and gives, supposedly, the true answer of whether or not M halts when run on its own encoding. So, you know, H gives back an answer, and D does the opposite. of H's answer. That is to say, if H accepts, then D will reject. And conversely, if it rejects, then D will accept. And remember what this means. If H accepts, that means that M, when run on its own description, <coughs> does accept. And if it rejects, that means M when run on its own restriction, uh, description, doesn't accept. It either haul, uh, rejects or it runs forever. OK, so I've finished describing the Turing machine D. And um, there's going to be a contradiction very soon. Any question? Mm -hmm. So the theorem, uh, sorry, did Turing prove using accepts or halt? I forget, but his paper is on the web page, so you should read it and find out. Uh, it makes very little difference to the proof, though. Yeah. Basically, D would still do the opposite uh, in that case, but then it just means if H reports that M when run on M halts, then D has to like go into an uh, infinite loop, for example. Um, but it's nicer this way because now we can say, uh, I'm just done describing uh, D, and let me remark that D is a decider. Remember that means on every input, D halts. And that's clear because, well, it crucially uses the fact that H is a decider, which is part of the assumption which we're trying to contradict. Okay, does somebody want to um, state what the 
uh, not what the punchline is, but the, the thought experiment you think about, which leads to a contradiction. You remember? Yeah? Yeah. So now D is like a well-defined Turing machine. It has an encoding. And now you just imagine what happens. <laughs> Remember, D takes as input a Turing machine description. So you just imagine running D on the encoding of D. And you say, could this accept or reject? Well, basically, uh, you see that a contradiction is reached. So how is that? <coughs> what happens when you run D on D? Um, it'll prepare the string D comma encoding of D. And then it'll ask H, hey, would this accept or reject? So like, um, suppose D when run on D accepts. Then you know, let's go through what D does. It prepares the string, in this case, M is the encoding of D, so it prepares the string D encoding of D, and then it asks H, hey, does it, does D accept or reject when you run it on itself? H, by assumption, gives you the correct answer, and now our, our further supposition is that the correct answer is that it accepts. But then, we get messed up because H will come back and say, yep, it accepts, and so then D does the opposite, it rejects. So we're like, if it accepts, then it rejects. Well, that's a contradiction. And conversely, if you say, well, maybe it rejects. Well, but then you'll ask H, hey, does D of D accept or reject? H will say, it rejects. So D will say, great, I accept. But that's a contradiction. Accept. So it's another contradiction. So either way, we have a contradiction. So the only way out of this is if this one is this statement is wrong. So this H cannot exist. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay. So that's cool. I mean, it's a great result um, because it shows a negative result for computation, like a problem that cannot be solved by any Turing machine, in fact. Yep? Um, I, just like, I, I don't know if this is a technical point or not, but when it like, accepts or not accepts, it's like, doesn't reject mean that it goes to the rejecting state, whereas not accept means that it could either reject or like, not call the Um Yeah. Oh, that's a good, well, um, that's true. D is a decider, good. So yeah, in general, a third, that's a, yeah, I didn't make a, that's a good point. So in general, D could either accept or reject, or in general, it might also run forever. So it might look like we missed a case here, but uh, we remarked here that D is a decider, so we already previously verified that on every input, it's going to either accept or reject. Good point, though, that's like something that should be said. Okay, good. So uh, I'm going to tell you in the last five minutes um, you know, what we're going to do next time, which is prove this thing called the time hierarchy theorem, which is, follows a very similar pattern to this Turing's theorem, except uh, it has sort of this feature where basically you don't have to assume that H exists. You can just, the D can like try to decide itself if uh, M accepts on M by running it for some fixed amount of time. And <coughs> so we'll, you know, um, do a simulation for a fixed amount of time. And somehow by plugging this idea into the proof, we'll get to a theorem that says there are languages where if I give you a small amount of time, you can't solve it. But I give you a large amount of time, you can solve it. So let me state the theorem that we're going to prove next time. It's called the time hierarchy theorem. OK, so I'm going to not state it in 100% correct detail, because this is a theorem where like, the idea of it is quite simple, and the idea of the proof is quite simple. 
But to like actually put in 100% of the details, sort of annoying. Um, well, that's what we're here for, so we're going to do it. But um, this is a theorem where it's best to sort of start with an overview and kind of like a weak version of the proof and then finally give all the details. So let's say t is some running time function. And this is like a, or it'll be a little bit vague. Let's, it'd be a reasonable um, time function. So I'll actually define what reasonable means next time. But like all the, like the normal running times you might think of, like n squared, n cubed, n log n, n to the 10, 2 to the n, they're all reasonable running times. You know, it includes things like it should be increasing and decidable and stuff like that. Um, then there exists a language A. Um, decidable in order t of n time. But not in time a lot less than t of n over log t of n. And what does a lot less than mean? Uh, it means little o of this, if you remember little o. I don't know if you remember this from uh, 251, if you did it then. But basically this. So for example, um, there exists an A, which is in time n cubed, but not in time, let's say n squared. Um, <coughs> yeah, or you can put n to the fourth and n cubed here, or you can put 10 to the n here and 5 to the n here, something like that. So basically, for any running time, you can find a language that can be solved in that amount of time, but it can't be solved in, you know, basically a little bit less than that. Okay, so this is what we'll prove next time, and as you'll see, it'll be kind of just an elaboration of Turing's theorem about uh, the halting problem. Any questions? Okay, see you on Tuesday. <laughs>